parts of the planet. So regular and predictable, one might think they've moved like this forever. What a contrast to things claimed by the first astronomers of ancient Mesopotamia and numerous cultures that followed. They watched planetary motions with a compulsive fear. Why would diligent astronomers insist that the planets were the towering gods of a prior time? Planets ruled the destiny of kings and kingdoms and they were the agents of doomsday, the end of the world. What was it about planets that inspired such reverence and fear? The Babylonian priest astronomer, Barosus, said that planets moving on different courses than today produced world catastrophe. In Greek, Roman, and Gnostic thought, this was ekperosis, a catastrophic meeting of the planets. But the memory of planetary disorder is echoed by numerous ancient sources. Plato expressed it, and so did Zoroastrian texts. The Hindu Mahabharata, Taoist teachings, and the Chinese bamboo books. Far from the spotlight today, researchers are exploring these questions of planetary history. They bring wide-ranging backgrounds from comparative mythology to planetary science and plasma physics. All are asking if the solar system may have been unstable in the past alive with electrical activity. Allow this question to be asked and the doors open to a new understanding of the past, of planetary history, and the rise of civilization itself. When we hear the word civilization, most of us think of new technology, economic advances, rapid communication, and expansive metropolitan vistas. But earlier civilizations are much different, and they pose a mystery yet to be resolved. Early civilizations were obsessed with the past. All looked back to extraordinary events, to an age of gods and wonders. All insisted that powerful gods ruled for a time, then went away. Monumental cultures arose, and the monuments themselves meant much more than a display of technical skill. A monument commemorates something collectively remembered. It was obsessive acts of remembering that shaped the early civilizations from the cities of Egypt stretched along the Nile to those of the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia, from India to Southeast Asia and China, and no less so in the Americas from the early predecessors of the Aztecs and the Maya to the archaic cultures of the central Andes all reveal a desperate urge to recover something lost. Egyptian priests called this lost epoch the Age of the Primeval Gods. 
It began with the rule of an earlier sun god, Autumn, who later departed. Cuneiform texts speak of the god On, who ruled with terrifying splendor, then fled the scene. The Greeks celebrated the lost age of Kronos, but he too was replaced by another power, the towering Zeus. Sages of India likewise remembered the rule of Brahma, though the god progressively faded into the background. So too the Chinese Shangdi and Huangdi, the Aztec Omityatl, and the Maya Itzim Na, all either departed for remote regions or faded from their original prominence. Through festivals and symbolic rites, the cultures remembered the lives of the gods. With every temple construction, every sacrifice, every harvest, every installation of a king, every royal marriage, every New Year festival, the celebrants reenacted critical turns in the lives of the gods themselves. Were you to remove the stories of the gods, there would be no cultural content left in the early civilizations. Who were the gods? And why did the early astronomers declare that the most powerful gods were planets? Here's a clue. The mythic accounts are punctuated by terror and cosmic violence. Urgent prayers and hymns reenacted the deaths or ordeals of great gods, recounting how one world age passed violently into another. At least some of the artistic and mythological themes will be familiar to you. The myth of paradise, or the golden age, for example. A perfect time before a descent into cosmic disaster. An exemplary sun, revered as the king of the world, ruling before the present sun. A mother goddess, a symbol of beauty and of life. A great warrior or hero born from the womb of that very goddess to rescue the world from monsters that are also unexplained. Perhaps there is no better example of an unexplained mythical theme than the serpent or dragon. 
This remarkable creature with origins in prehistoric times has no counterpart in the biological world. Yet it was remembered on every habitable continent and persisted across the millennia into modern times. Well, we can find amusement in the comic book versions of this monster. But nothing in nature today will explain the dragon's long flowing hair, its fiery breath, its beard, its twin whiskers, its wings or effusive feathers, or its global occurrence as twins, or its global association with lightning. Thousands of years after its prehistoric birth, the monster continues to linger in human fantasy. It will not go away. But ask yourself, how could the dragon archetype have arisen without provocation? And should we not wonder if uniquely modern prejudices are the primary reason the mystery remains unsolved? With one voice, every ancient culture insisted that our world was once a much different place. Several thousand years ago, events of beauty and terror provoked an explosion of human imagination. This was the myth-making epoch of human history. First came the enchanted realm, the theater of venerated gods and goddesses. The gods were prodigious. Their celestial habitat towered over the world, a model for temples and commemorative monuments on earth. But the gods grew capricious. One celestial power metamorphosed into another. Preposterous creatures never seen on earth roamed the sky. The gods turned violent as heaven itself fell into chaos. Then celestial warriors and monsters appeared to battle in the heavens, wielding weapons of thunder and fire and stone. Our challenge will be to account for this outpouring of mythic content. psychoanalyst called these deep patterns the archetypes. He saw them as universal structures of the unconscious, lying beyond rational or scientific explanation. Yes, the myths seem incomprehensible to us. 
but the archetypes offer a pathway through the confusion. They are the points of agreement between the far-flung cultures. And this agreement rises above the carnival of confusion and contradiction. Every major culture remembered a cosmic mountain around which the heavens turned. And every culture chronicled the terrible aspect of the mother goddess. Were there no common experience, the archetypal agreement would not even be possible. All that is required here is a willingness to meet the archetypes and without fear or prejudice or any advanced assumptions to hear their message. The existence of hundreds of archetypes is a fact. And it is a fact as well that no archetype speaks for natural events occurring today, not a single one. At the dawn of civilization, all of the archetypes were already present. Today we are fascinated by the monumental scale of the antique civilizations. But what were the essential memories that drove the monumental culture so obsessively? The threads of evidence trace deep into the prehistoric past, a world barely recognized, but not entirely lost. More than 10,000 years ago, Paleolithic artists painted these images on the walls of Lascaux Cave in France. They were realists, with an exceptional eye for detail. Why these talented artists of the Stone Age disappeared remains a mystery. But the greater mystery is the epoch that followed. It seems that Neolithic artists lost the ability to depict nature as we know it. Accurate representations of nature are present, but the dominant style produced a carnival of ghostly creatures and absurd forms never seen in our world. How did this tendency arise, not in one land alone, but on every habitable continent? Absurd, yes, but what provoked the distinctive patterns? A stick man with no head, just a duck or other bird on his shoulders? Hundreds of variations on this theme occur in the American Southwest. But the pattern doesn't end there. Notice the twin dots on the two sides of these crudely crafted stick figures. 
one instance alone is just a curiosity. But widespread patterns must have an explanation. And other details only accent the irrationality. Recently, an answer to these mysteries came from outside traditional archaeology, from plasma science and laboratory experiments with electric discharge. Plasma scientist Anthony Peratt of Los Alamos Laboratories has shown that these stick forms recorded electrical events in the sky. Something like the northern lights we see today, but a thousand times more energetic. And he matches the rock art forms precisely to the configurations taken by electric discharge in the laboratory. The rock art images are explained as sheets of intense electric current in the evolution of a plasma discharge. The central column you see in this stylized representation is the axis of the discharge. Wrapped around the axis is a torus or donut-like tubular sheet of charged particles. The observer sees through the transparent formation, champagne glass above, squashed bell shape below, so the plasma density is greatest at the limbs. Drawn in two dimensions, the formation matches the stick man carved globally on stone by the thousands. The two dots under the stick man's arms are the exceedingly bright, high energy radiation. called synchrotron radiation, emitted from the center of the torus. The current sheets continually warp as the electric discharge progresses, and this form is not uncommon. A two-dimensional representation might look like this. Pratt's work has shown that the stick man, the duck-headed version of the American Southwest and variations from Hawaii to Saudi Arabia, is a plasma discharge formation, a subject on which he is an acknowledged world expert. Pratt's investigation is entirely independent from our own. Thousands of rock art images have enabled a supercomputer to identify formations as seen from different positions on Earth. The fit that he has documented cannot be accidental. And yet our own investigation, which preceded Peratz by almost three decades, converges with his in extraordinary ways, as I shall clarify in the second episode of this series. For scholars and scientists as a whole, rock art remains an unsolved mystery. For 200 years, experts have debated over the vast library of images on stone. Definitive considerations are now in hand, calling for a new perspective, one that follows the compelling evidence for high-energy electrical events in the ancient sky. And those who pursue this line of investigation must not be afraid to ask how the movements of planets may have contributed to an electrified cosmic environment of which science knew nothing only a few decades ago. Is it possible that a fundamental mistake has crept into the sciences? Today we witness an unshakable confidence in the regularity of planetary motions. 
But is this confidence truly justified? I need to take you back about 37 years. That was when the controversial theorist Emanuel Velikovsky lit a fire for me. He was the author of the book Worlds in Collision, first published in 1950, and several other books that followed. In these books he reinterpreted both planetary history and human history. A distinguished scholar, colleague of Albert Einstein, Velikovsky had claimed that planets formerly moved on unstable courses, and more than once a planet came close enough to Earth to cause global catastrophe. Most astronomers dismissed the book out of hand, and some threatened a boycott of the publisher Macmillan forcing the company to drop the book when it was the number one bestseller. But when the space age arrived, our probes of planets and moons revealed devastated surfaces, inspiring renewed interest in Velikovsky's claims. With Velikovsky's cooperation, I had the privilege of publishing a 10-issue series on his challenge to science. Velikovsky said that cosmic catastrophe left its marks on the now peaceful planets, our Earth included. He said that the planet Venus appeared in the sky as a comet, and that its near collision with the Earth decimated early civilizations. He said that electricity was highly active in these events. Planets moved on erratic courses, and on occasion they nearly collided as cosmic lightning bolts flew between the approaching bodies. And he said that human memories of these events constitute evidence that science cannot afford to ignore. It soon became clear to me that Velikovsky had opened the door to a new possibility, perhaps even a new understanding of the mythic archetypes as a whole. But why did the evidence always seem too preposterous to believe? Why did all of the archaic cultures stake everything on memories of the gods as towering bodies in a former sky? I was particularly enchanted by something Velikovsky proposed in a work still unpublished at the time. He claimed that, in the earliest remembered epoch, the planet Saturn dominated the sky, close to the Earth, presiding over the mythic Golden Age. It was an outrageous idea, and yet I found in it the inspiration for a life's work. Ancient cultures the world over insisted that an exemplary sun once ruled the sky. For the Egyptians, this former power was the creator Atum Ra, ruling from the center and summit of the sky. In ancient Mesopotamia, we see the primeval sun as a great turning wheel in the heavens, and the astronomers named this body as the planet Saturn. It was from the Romans that we received the planet's name, Saturn. But an archaic Latin name for Saturn was Sol, the Sun. In earlier Greek texts, the planet Saturn, called Kronos, was also named Helios, the Sun.
and even the alchemists preserved this preposterous identity. They called Saturn the best sun. Best sun, superior sun, exemplary sun, the core idea always pointed directly to the axis of the sky, the celestial pole around which the heavens visually turn. As improbable as it may seem, this is where the Egyptians located their primeval sun god, Atum. This motionless spot in the heavens is precisely where later astronomical traditions from Greece to Persia and China all claimed that Saturn had ruled the world, a contradiction of every principle we take for granted today. Ancient chroniclers insisted that the planet Saturn, now just a speck in the sky, had presided over the Golden Age, an epoch of abundance, cosmic harmony, and grandeur. The archaic name of Italy was Saturnia, and tradition held that this very name was given to the original site of Rome. The Sabbath, the special day of rest and reverence, was Saturni Dies, Saturn's Day, a day honored throughout the Mediterranean, the Near East, and beyond. The popular Roman festival, Saturnalia, was a symbolic return to the Saturnia Regna, Saturn's reign, the Golden Age. Much symbolic content of our own New Year's and Christmas celebrations will trace to the Roman Saturnalia and related ancient festivals. In one form or another, every culture that remembered Saturn's reign regarded the planet God as the father of kings, the father of the nation or the race. Ancient traditions identified the Ugaritic and Hebrew El as Saturn. And it was said that the Israelites once saw themselves as Saturn's children. In the same way, the Greeks invoked Kronos as their first father and the Romans insisted that they were the true descendants of Saturn, arriving in Italy through the adventures of the legendary ancestor Aeneas. But there was a dark side to Saturn reflecting the catastrophic end of the Golden Age. This was when, in the words of Manilius, Saturn, the first father, fell to the opposite end of the world axis. This sudden onset of chaos, when heaven itself seemed to fall out of control, has haunted civilizations across the millennia, erupting as doomsday anxiety, the fear that what happened once will happen again. It's almost impossible to believe that ancient people sacrificed their own children, either symbolically or literally, to the planet god Saturn. Saturn was remembered as the devourer of his own children. And as Moloch, demanding sacrifice. And as El, or the Elohim, commanding Abraham to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. In the face of evidence that cannot be denied, the reasonable course is to bring the catastrophic source of these memories into the light of day.
my book The Saturn Myth, published by Doubleday in 1980, began the reconstruction of a spectacular formation formerly seen in the sky, a gathering of planets looming immense above the ancient witnesses. I was working with the mythic archetypes, cultures everywhere using different words and different symbols to describe eerily similar events. But the planetary model presented in the Saturn myth was far from complete. Amongst the greatest of enigmas was the cosmic wheel recorded by every ancient culture. Images of a wheel in the sky carved on stone are older than civilization itself. Many archaeologists see these wheels as an imagined vehicle of the sun rolling across the sky. But in its most common form, the cosmic wheel doesn't go anywhere. Often it rests on a stationary pillar, or atop a stairway, or ladder, or is turned by a rope while resting on an altar or table. And the spokes of the wheel are not functional as such, they are fluid and etheric. Archaic gods and heroes hold a wheel in their hands. A cosmic wheel served as the throne of gods and cultural heroes and wise men, symbolically replicated in the wheel thrones of kings on earth. The wheel throne of Buddha underscores our point. And even the popular footprint of Buddha recalls the same wheel in heaven. The inspiration did not come from our sun. Compare these prehistoric instances of the pictographic wheel from Ireland and from California. Different parts of the wheel are clearly evident. A large circle or sphere, though not always present, a central star, and a smaller, darker circle or sphere inside the star-like form. The images do not depict a single object, but three objects, as demonstrated here, where the artists place the small dark sphere well below the central star. I can assure you that the placements are not random. These forms in the sky were planets in close congregation and immense above the ancient sky worshippers. The stories begin with the appearance of this celestial formation, heaven, when heaven was close to the earth. The original unity of the sky formed by the great conjunction when a straight line or arrow could pierce the hearts of the gathered powers. The motionless superior sun ruling before the present sun. The father of kings and first in the mythic line of kings and a dying or displaced god. In later times, the first astronomers identified this overarching ruler of the sky. They claimed it was the planet Saturn, remembered as the owner of the cosmic wheel before the god departed for distant realms. The astronomical traditions also named the central star as Venus, the mother goddess and they named the darker, reddish sphere as the planet Mars, the cosmic warrior. In these three hours, I intend to demonstrate that the stories of the gods are the stories of what happens to these celestial bodies. You're looking at reconstructed images of a formation in the heavens just a few thousand years ago. The configuration evolved through many phases, evoking reverence and awe, a model for kings and kingdoms for thousands of years. Great temples and cities and sacred mountains all pointed back to the mythic age of gods and wonders.
Let the world's first astronomers point the way for us. They knew that what the myths and hymns and prayers called gods were planets and aspects of planets. Planets appeared close to the Earth in a heaven-spanning configuration. Memories of that celestial splendor still surround us, even if humanity later forgot much more than it remembered. Reconnecting with our forgotten past will be essential. Essential for our own cultural integrity. Essential for the study of human consciousness. And essential for all of the sciences. Just a few thousand years ago, our ancestors witnessed a gathering of planets close to the Earth. An explosion of human imagination occurred, an outpouring of mythology and symbolism that defined cultures for thousands of years long after the celestial provocation itself was forgotten. In these early historical times, there are no records of the present planets, no diaries recording planetary motions or periods, Planets as we know them today did not exist. These were the gods, awe-inspiring, and at times capricious and terrifying. Early star worshippers speak of a great light of heaven, motionless in the sky, the Egyptian Atum or Atum Ra, the Sumerian An, the Babylonian Anu. And enigmatically, early astronomers knew the overarching figure as the planet Saturn, whose story will be a centerpiece of our third episode. In the beginning, the gathered powers were not seen as separate gods, but as the primeval unity of heaven the perfect conjunction, or great conjunction of the Golden Age. A massive sphere hung in the sky, and in its center stood a radiant star surrounded by explosive streamers. Cultures the world over came to see this star in feminine terms as the mother goddess, the planet Venus. Remembered as the great star, the mother of all stars. This was the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun, his animating life, power, and glory, and much more. One of the most enigmatic cultural themes is the transformation of the life-giving goddess into a monstrous form, attacking the world. This was the terrible goddess, raging in the sky with wildly disordered hair, or multiple flailing arms, a celestial spectacle radiating a paralyzing light. When instability and displacement occurred, 
The streamers discharging from Venus grew chaotic, giving the planet a frightful countenance. The angry goddess was a comet. The mythic prototype of comets. Emmanuel Velikovsky's great comet, the planet Venus. Seen in front of this central star was a smaller, darker, reddish sphere. This was the mythic warrior, the masculine heart of the heart, the child in the womb, the child on the lap, the pupil of the eye, the axle of the cosmic wheel, the most active figure of world mythology. Sky worshippers everywhere knew the identity of this warrior, the victor over dragons and chaos monsters. This global identity of Mars as the greatest of warriors shouts to us an unrecognized history. On the great sphere of heaven, a bright crescent appeared, with the orb or star of Venus between its horns. Things never seen in our sky were once revered around the world. As the Earth rotated on its axis, the crescent marked out a cycle of day and night crescent below in the phase of greatest brightness, crescent above in the phase of dimming. Though our sun was present, casting its light on the configuration, it was not itself in the visual theater of the gods. I called this the polar configuration because the earth itself rotated in alignment with the forms in the sky placing these forms at a celestial pole around which the heavens visually turned. The configuration evolved through numerous phases. The number of streamers changed repeatedly, as did their observed form. Every change in relative position produced dramatic changes in the appearance of the configuration. In 1996, the Canadian filmmaker Ben Gad Lowe spent many months in Portland producing a 90-minute documentary on the reconstruction. At that time, many dynamic issues were largely unresolved. But later that year, the Australian physicist Wallace Thornhill flew to Portland for a 30-day visit. He convinced me that the forms I'd reconstructed were electrical. They were plasma discharge streamers stretching between planets. He explained that in a radial electric discharge, both the number of streamers and their concrete form will change with the intensity of the discharge. The whirling forms I'd reconstructed in the common symmetry, which I'd often laughed about, did indeed have a physical explanation. 
At the time of his visit, Wal Thornhill had devoted more than 25 years to exploring what he called the electric universe. His work follows in the traditions of the electrical and plasma science pioneers who showed that electricity plays a major role in space, that galaxies, stars, and planets are formed electrically, that comets with their bright tails move through an electric field of the sun. His electrical interpretation extended to the origin of bizarre landscapes on planets and moons, now explained by the well-tested principles of electrical arcing. In an electric solar system, if two planets or moons approach each other from regions of different potential, electric discharge will occur, producing plasma formations stretching between the approaching bodies. Plasma laboratory experiments can tell us what the formations might look like. The backbone is typically a column of twisted filaments, but disks and embedded cylinders also arise to evolve in spectacular ways. The counterpart to such formations can be seen in ancient depictions of the cosmic thunderbolt. But what an outrageous idea that exotic formations could arise between planets in close approach. What then was the relationship of the cosmic thunderbolt to the magical swords, arrows, clubs, and spears of the great warrior gods? With a stunning accord, ancient languages identify these weapons as special forms of the cosmic thunderbolt. Scholars have already identified the sword and arrows of Apollo, the spear of Zeus, the trident of Poseidon, as aspects of the divine thunderbolt. The same linkage occurs with the Greek Ares, the Latin Mars, whose sword was his identity. First came the thunderbolt, the core archetype. Then came its mythic interpretation as a weapon of the warrior god. Placed in the hands of the gods, the cosmic thunderbolt provides a bridge for us, joining the mythic world to the leading edge of plasma science. One simple truth will change the future of science and our understanding of human history. The ancient sky bore no resemblance to the sky we see today. Above human witnesses, planetary formations hovered close to the earth.
one electrical form metamorphosed into another in the celestial dance of the mythic star goddess and the cosmic warrior, astronomically identified as the planets Venus and Mars. Ancient observers saw the head of the warrior king wrapped in the radiance of the star goddess. It was his crown of glory. And it was the warrior's magical protection, worn as a helmet or crest, but much more. The dancing Aztec god wore the rays of Venus as a crest, but also held the so-called half-star of Venus in an outstretched hand. And he even wore this protective radiance as his skirt. The theme is universal. The warrior's armor was the radiance of the great star, and that is the explanation for the unexplained radiant crown of kings. As the forms of the configuration changed, the mythic interpretations changed as well. In pictures and words, the ancient chroniclers recounted the cosmic conjunction of the goddess and the warrior. The goddess was the eye, and the warrior was the pupil of the eye. Two spheres in alignment inspired a mythical interpretation as an eye and pupil inscribed upon the hand of God. The five fingers of the hand were the visible aspects of an eight-spoked wheel in a different phase. Buddhist symbolists knew that the hand bore a secret relationship to the eight-spoked Dharma wheel. Buddha was the motionless axle of the wheel. Enthroned upon the hand of heaven, he was surrounded and protected by the celestial fire of the gods. Every form that arose provoked a variety of mythical interpretations, not just a single idea. The spokes of the wheel were the animating soul and power of the universal sovereign, exploding into life at sunset. That is the meaning of the mythic plant of life. hundreds of imaginative images and not one speaks for events in the heavens today, not a single one. Even when the concrete form of the cosmic original was forgotten, the imaginative idea persisted for thousands of years. Innumerable concrete details will not allow us to just make up explanations for the myths and symbols. Some symbols remained abstract, but more often they added mythical interpretation to the underlying form. And many mythical images seemingly incompatible will trace to the same tangible form. The plant of life was not just an attractive design element. It was a form in the sky, inspiring a story of vast influence. 
In his birth or rebirth, the warrior god emerged from the radiant flower. The diverse mythical interpretations and the larger stories told about these events all point to a unified substructure of human memory. A great wheel turned in the heavens, and it was remembered around the world. Even the modest displacement of the aligned powers was captured in ancient images. Why was the Egyptian goddess identified as the headdress of the warrior king? It's the underlying form that gives us the answer. A primeval sun ruled the world, shining most brightly in the night sky. A crescent came to adorn this primeval sun, and it certainly was not our moon. The great star of Venus rested between its horns, and visually seated within this star was the planet Mars. A luminous stream appeared to descend from Mars, the first form of the cosmic thunderbolt. Human imagination saw a sword or dagger thrust into the region below. The warrior god was his sword, envisioned also as an axial pen, peg, or mooring post of the turning sky. The same thing as the stem of the plant of life. and the pillar-like lower limbs of the goddess. The same form in the sky was seen as a protruding tongue of both the warrior and the angry goddess. A pronounced movement of Mars occurred close to but not precisely on the planetary axis. Now the celestial crescent appeared as the horns of the warrior himself in his identity as the bull of heaven. And it should not surprise us that the foundation post bore the image of the bull at its apex. When it reached the earth, the stream presented the form of a great pillar or cosmic mountain. Perhaps it is too much to believe that the famous bull of heaven was just a pillar and shining horns. To these events we will trace the worldwide myths of the heaven-lifting cosmic giant, the first active form of the warrior hero. His upraised arms were precisely the same thing as the horns of the bull of heaven, a testament to the integrity of the substructure, the archetypes.
In some phases with the movement of Mars, dust and electrified plasma streaming between Mars and Venus became visible to terrestrial observers. Even small changes in this dusty plasma stream, were we to view the formation from space, would create distinctive differences in the appearance of the configuration. The great kings of ancient times wore conical crowns in numerous and always enigmatic varieties. For these revered forms, the experts can find no referent in nature today. Yet the priestly chroniclers of antiquity knew that these crowns imitated the vestment of a cosmic warrior, the prototype of the warrior king on earth. With progressive instability and displacement from the axis, the stream joining Mars and Venus spiraled outward. This was the mother goddess herself, the radiant eye, heart and soul of the primeval sun, now externalized as a curling lock of hair. And the earliest sources leave no doubt that it was a visible form in the sky. The sidelock of the warrior king mimicked that of his predecessor, the cosmic warrior. This curling life breath provoked innumerable symbols, far more than we could include here. Just one example was the mooring post in the sky, signifying the outflow of the eye and the evolving form of creation itself. A critical turn came with the removal of the life breath curl, unleashing the terrible goddess and a cosmic crisis. In his rage, the Hindu Shiva tore out a lock of his hair from which arose his own dark aspect, the monster Virabhadra. And close by the terrifying form of the angry goddess, whom we recognize as the Comet Venus. The Medusa archetype was only a nuance away from the celestial serpent or dragon, with its bright filaments, effusive feathers, long flowing hair, and lightning emanations, the global symbols of the great comet. In Egypt, the eye, heart, and soul of Ra departed from the god to become the fiery Uraeus serpent, rampaging in the heavens. Astronomical traditions throughout the Mediterranean and Near East confirm that this goddess was the planet Venus. The ancient Sumerians identified Venus as Inanna, the serpent or dragon mother, unapproachable in her rage. The disordered comet-like hair of the Chinese dragon was an overriding feature, as was the discharging sphere or so-called night-glowing pearl, its spiraling attributes, and the lightning emanations of the dragon itself. Long after the remembered events, the Aztecs still knew the comet as streaming feathers.
they knew the connection of the comet to a cosmic serpent. And they remembered the connection of both to the planet Venus. From the episodes of disorder, a phase of celestial construction emerged, focused on the activity of the spiraling form, or raid spiral, remembered as the serpent of creation. This was the expanded enclosure of the mother goddess herself, the motherland in the sky, the true subject of the archaic creation legend. The mythic home of gods and heroes lay within an enclosure formed by the body of the celestial serpent or dragon. The evolving forms noted here are provable phases in the biography of the mother goddess largely ignored but confirmed at the level of concrete detail in the early cultures. The priests of ancient Egypt knew that the white crown was the mother goddess. They knew that the life breath curl and the revolving lock of hair were the same goddess. Across all of Egypt, the chroniclers remembered the luminous spiral with its radial projections as the agent of celestial construction. From north to south, they described the goddess, originally the Eye of Ra, taking the form of a flaming serpent, whose hieroglyph means goddess. And it was this very serpent that came to form an enclosure, the boundary of Natertah, the celestial kingdom. Mesoamerican artists understood very well that the fire serpent or dragon enclosing the land of the gods had appeared as a raid spiral. The created land of the gods emerging from the dance of the goddess and the hero presented four streams of light and life. Here was the motherland in the sky, the celestial model for every kingdom and city on earth, the lost land of mythic ancestors, divided by four rivers or animated by four explosive winds and turning as a great wheel in the sky. To be sure, the evolution of myth over time brought endless elaborations of the archetype, Yet even in the enthusiasm to extend the symbolism, the substratum of human memory does shine through. The complexities of the Aztec calendar wheel did not eliminate the axial role of the warrior hero or the four exploding streams of life energy or the circumscribing, often double-headed serpent, or the identity of that serpent as the fire of the gods. As a rule, later spiritual traditions did not displace these human memories either but found in them the symbolic landscape for expressing insights and beliefs that would guide later interpretations of myth.
Lastly, we must acknowledge one of the most pervasive symbols of world mythology. All mythic traditions agree that the land of the gods rested on the golden or fiery mountain of heaven. It is evident that the core symbols of human yearning, suffering, and devotion across the millennia trace to the very events from which the first civilizations themselves arose. Now the question must be asked, if the great mythic archetypes are explained by events unknown to our world, what can the electric universe and the leading edge of plasma science Tell us about the ancient experience.
an age of gods and wonders. All insisted that powerful gods ruled for a time, then went away. Monumental cultures arose, and the monuments themselves meant much more than a display of technical skill. A monument commemorates something collectively remembered. It was obsessive acts of remembering that shaped the early civilizations, from the cities of Egypt stretched along the Nile to those of the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia, from India to Southeast Asia and China, and no less so in the Americas, from the early predecessors of the Aztecs and the Maya to the archaic cultures of the Central Andes. All reveal a desperate urge to recover something lost. Egyptian priests called this lost epoch the Age of the Primeval Gods. It began with the rule of an earlier sun god, Atum, who later departed. Cuneiform texts speak of the god An, who ruled with terrifying splendor, then fled the scene. The Greeks celebrated the lost age of Kronos, but he too was replaced by another power, the towering Zeus. Sages of India likewise remembered the rule of Brahma, though the god progressively faded into the background. So too the Chinese Shangdi and Huangdi, the Aztec Omityatl, and the Maya Itzimna, all either departed for remote regions or faded from their original prominence. a symbol of beauty and of life. A great warrior or hero born from the womb of that very goddess to rescue the world from monsters that are also unexplained. Perhaps there is no better example of an unexplained mythical theme than the serpent or dragon. This remarkable creature with origins in prehistoric times has no counterpart in the biological world, yet it was remembered on every habitable continent and persisted across the millennia into modern times. <laughs> Well, we can find amusement in the comic book versions of this monster. But nothing in nature today will explain the dragon's long flowing hair, its fiery breath, its beard, its twin whiskers, its wings or effusive feathers. or its global occurrence as twins, or its global association with lightning. Thousands of years after its prehistoric birth, 
The monster continues to linger in human fantasy. It will not go away. But ask yourself, how could the dragon archetype have arisen without provocation? And sh Through festivals and symbolic rites, the cultures remembered the lives of the gods. With every temple construction, every sacrifice, every harvest, every installation of a king, every royal marriage, every New Year festival. The celebrants reenacted critical turns in the lives of the gods themselves. Were you to remove the stories of the gods, there would be no cultural content left in the early civilizations. Who were the gods? And why did the early astronomers declare that the most powerful gods were planets? Here's a clue. The mythic accounts are punctuated by terror and cosmic violence. Urgent prayers and hymns reenacted the deaths or ordeals of great gods, recounting how one world age passed violently into another. At least some of the artistic and mythological themes will be familiar to you. The myth of paradise, or the golden age, for example. A perfect time before a descent into cosmic disaster. An exemplary sun, revered as the king of the world, ruling before the present sun. A mother goddess. of the planets. So regular and predictable one might think they've moved like this forever. What a contrast to things claimed by the first astronomers of ancient Mesopotamia and numerous cultures that followed. They watched planetary motions with a compulsive fear. 
Why would diligent astronomers insist that the planets were the towering gods of a prior time? Planets ruled the destiny of kings and kingdoms, and they were the agents of doomsday, the end of the world. What was it about planets that inspired such reverence and fear? The Babylonian priest astronomer, Barosus, said that planets moving on different courses than today produced world catastrophe. In Greek, Roman, and Gnostic thought, this was ekperosis, a catastrophic meeting of the planets. But the memory of planetary disorder is echoed by numerous ancient sources. Plato expressed it, and so did Zoroastrian texts. The Hindu Mahabharata. Taoist teachings. And the Chinese bamboo books. Far from the spotlight today, researchers are exploring these questions of planetary history. They bring wide-ranging backgrounds from comparative mythology to planetary science and plasma physics. All are asking if the solar system may have been unstable in the past. Alive with electrical activity. Allow this question to be asked and the doors open to a new understanding of the past of planetary history and the rise of civilization itself. When we hear the word civilization, most of us think of new technology, economic advances, rapid communication, and expansive metropolitan vistas. But earlier civilizations are much different, and they pose a mystery yet to be resolved. Early civilizations were obsessed with the past. All looked back to extraordinary events, to